Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with Blow, Gabriel, Blow. People are just naturally more thrifty than others. But most of us, no matter how much we try to save, are wasteful in little things. And don't these little things pile up into big ones? For example, do you always remember to put the covers back securely on packages like coffee, toothpaste, yes, even floor wax? Next time you use your can or bottle of Johnson's wax, remember to put the lid or cover back on tightly. That prevents evaporation and helps keep the wax in best condition. And here's another conservation tip on Johnson's Wax. For best results, use it sparingly in a thin coat and spread it as far as it will go. You don't need a heavy coat to get protection for your floors, furniture or woodwork, your leather goods, enameled or painted surfaces. A thin coat polished to a hard surface gives not only protection, but rich, mellow beauty. to a man's heart may be through his stomach, but if you want to take a shortcut, go through his ego. As witness, Mrs. Uppington talking to Fibber McGee and Molly. So what did you tell your nephew, Uppy? I told him to come and see you, Mr. McGee, that you were just the man to give him some advice on how to get on in the world and to make something of himself. Uh, You don't mind. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> Mind. Look at him, Abigail. <laughs> He's as proud and happy as a man who doesn't own a car, can't eat sugar, and hates coffee. You send that boy to me, Uppy. I'll put him straight. Oh, splendid, Mr. McGee. Splendid. Uh, he's not a bad boy. Just at loose ends. What do you mean, loose ends, Abigail? Well, the last I knew, he was a cook in a spaghetti place. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I see him. Loose ends, I see what you mean. <laughs> well, how's he for the Army and Navy, Uppy? Oh, he's tried many times to enlist, Mr. McGee, but, but they've always turned him down. Why? Oh, for mere boyish pranks. Forgery, for one thing. <laughs> forgery? You call forgery a boyish prank? What's murder to you, disorderly conduct? <laughs> oh, but it was a boyish prank in this case, Mr. McGee. Yeah? He wanted the army to think he would be a good soldier, yeah. so he signed his application, Ulysses S. Grand. <laughs> well, I can understand that, Abigail, but uh, why did the Navy refuse him? His reflexes were too good. Too good? Yes, yes. When they tapped him on the knee with that little rubber hammer, uh-huh. he kicked the doctor right in the jaw. <laughs> A simple case of over-enthusiasm. He tried for the Marines, Uppy? Indeed he did, Mr. McGee, but he was turned down for deafness. Deafness, eh? Yes. It seems he didn't hear them when they told him to put the sergeant's watch back where he got it. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think the boy is just full of high spirits, Abigail. And maybe just a touch of larceny. Well, I can handle him, Uppy. I'll make him brace up and act like a man. I'll tell him how I started out as a ragged little newsboy. Saved my money. Went to night school. McGee. Huh? Remember, this is Tuesday. So what? Meatless day. Huh? Save the bologna. (laughs) Well, I'll send him over here this evening, Miss McGee, and you'll give him a good talking to. He thinks very highly of you. Just leave it to me, Uppy. It's obvious the boy just got in with a tough crowd, that's all. Associated with the wrong people. How does he spend his spare time? Uh... Playing pool, I believe. Oh, Oh, my. With whom, Abigail? Well, I don't know all of them, of course, but he says a week ago Saturday he took Mr. McGee for (laughs) $1.45. Well, 
week ago Saturday. I don't remember that. Look, my ragged little newsboy. <laughs> Aren't you getting a little out of your depth? What do you mean, out of my depth? Setting yourself up to giving uh, young men advice. Who do you think you are, Horace Gridley? <laughs> that was Horace Greeley. Well, <laughs> you know me. I don't know one horse from another. <laughs> Anyway, now, when her nephew comes over here tonight, I hope you... Say, what's his name? His name? Oh, you know his name. His name is why his name is... Uh... Now, wait a minute now. You should know it. You played pool with him, she said. Doggone it. I don't know everybody I played pool with. That's the trouble. You're associating with the wrong crowd. Oh. Bad company. Say, incidentally, when did you ever go to night school? Well, it was just the same as night school. They kept me in so often, I never got home till after dark. <laughs> What is that guy's name? Shucks, I know his name as well as I do my own. And what is your name? My name is, uh... You know, wait a minute. I got it right here on my driver's license. <laughs> Trevor McGee. Oh. How do you do? Very glad to make... Oh, cut it out. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I got to think of that kid's name. Oh, I know. What? I'm going to get down to that spaghetti place where he works and get some dope on him. I'll be right back. Wait a minute, I... I'll go with you. Huh? You'll forget his name before you get home. Is there any gasoline in the car? Yeah, but it's got two flat tires. I'll call a cab. Oh, now, McGee, spending all that money just... Molly, to... this is worth it. A boy's future is at stake. It's a great responsibility. Why, when I think how I struggled up the ladder of success, scrimping and saving and burning the midnight oil to... A... Hey, where are you going? To get my hat. Mrs. Uppington's nephew may have to listen to that malarkey, but I don't. <laughs> you call a cab, I'll be right down, dearie. Ah, boy, what a chance to be a good influence in a kid's life. Now, look here, son, I'll say. Every clean, living, red-blooded American boy has... Got... Hi, mister. Ah, beat it, sis. I haven't got time to talk to you today. I got a mold of character. Oh. You see, my boy, us men who have reached the top of the ladder... Hey, mister. Oh, quit shaking the ladder. I mean... <laughs> look, sis, will you hey, please... Hey, do you know Bob Hope, mister? Why, sure I know Bob Hope. Why? Is he nice? Why, oh, he's great, sis. There ain't a guy in show business that gives more of his time and his work to a good cause than Bob Hope. Oh. He's not only a sincere American, but he's a great comedian. And he's got one of the best radio shows on... Hey, what am I saying? <laughs> Why do you want to know about Bob Hope, sis? Well, maybe I better tell you first, mister, that the, the Junior Red Cross is calling for new members between November 1st and 15th. Well, that's fine, but I don't suppose... And it's people... up to us kids to show we're interested in it so we can get our teachers to introduce it in our classroom activities, I betcha. <laughs> well, good for you, sis. But what has Bob Hope It's got... awful important, mister. Uh-huh. Gee, did you know that ever since President Wilson started it in the last war, the Junior Red Cross has grown to be the biggest organization for us kids in the world? Well, that, that goes without saying, sis. You're too late. I already said it. <laughs> I know what I Did meant to say. Did you know that the Junior Red Cross collected almost a million pounds of scrap three months after the war started? Did you, mister? Hmm, did you? Hmm, did you? Well, <laughs> I can't and say that. And did you know that we donated over $300,000 for relief of children in war zones? Hmm, did you? Hmm, did you? Yeah, well, <laughs> 300000 did, bucks. did you know that Junior Red Cross sent over 100,000 gift boxes to 33? countries last year. Hmm, did you? Hmm, did you? Well, <laughs> no, I never I realized. I bet you didn't even know we donated over three million comfort and entertainment items to our armed forces, I bet you. Well, sis, this begins to sound like an important hunk of business. What's the procedure as to getting the grip and the password? Well, we... Hmm? I says, what does a boy or girl got to do to join up? Oh, it's easy, mister. All I gotta do is ask their teacher to get in touch with the local Red Cross for complete information. Well, that's very interesting. And I'm glad you told me about it, sis, because... Hey, wait a minute. But why were you asking about Bob Hope? Well, we gotta get this message across to a whole lot of people, mister, and <laughs> I thought if you knew Mr. Hope, maybe you could get him to put it on the radio. <laughs>
Now, you just sit down there, my boy, and let's talk this thing all over. I'm not going to lecture you. I was a young fellow once myself, but I was ambitious. Started out as a ragged little newsboy. One day, a rich customer gave me a $5 gold piece, thinking it was a quarter. And he was gone before I discovered the mistake. Well, sir, I'll admit I was tempted. But my better judgment won out, and I never told him about it. <laughs> That's why I always say to you, young fellow. who are you talking to? Huh? Oh, nobody. Just rehearsing what I'm going to tell Huffington's nephew tonight. <laughs> Ragged little newsboy. Yeah. Say, you couldn't sell papers at three for a cent if Mussolini shot Hitler in 96 point type. <laughs> Is the taxi cab here yet? Nobody's on his way. Doggone, I wish I could think of Uppy's nephew's name. That's mad thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're certainly finding out the expensive way. <laughs> Say, maybe if we call... Uh-oh, uh-huh. there's the cab, dearie. Yeah. Are you ready? All set. Come on. Uh, you, Mr. McGee, you call for a cab? You betcha, bud. We want to go to that spaghetti place on the corner of 14th and Oak. Oh, you don't want to go there, Doc. That's a horrible journey. Huh? Why, that guy serves a meatball that's strictly a leftover from the National Open. <laughs> now, I know a place now, up listen on... listen here. Look, driver, we don't want any other place. We want the one at 14th and Oak for a certain reason. Okay. Okay, lady, you're the doctor. And if your husband eats there, he'll need one. Hop in, folks. <laughs> Well, here you are, folks. So you better wait for us, driver. We'll only be in here a minute. Lady, a minute in that joint is the experience of a lifetime. <laughs> now, me personally, I got a bad case of romaine eaten in there one night. You mean tomaine, bud. Romaine is a kind of a lettuce. Well, maybe it was the lettuce, Doc, but it sure give me a bad case of romaine. <laughs> Come on, McGee. Can't you hear that meter going jingle, jangle, jingle? Okay, we'll be back in a minute, bud. Kids, welcome to Chateau Ravioli. Well, for goodness sakes, Mr. Oldtimer, how long you been working here? Seems like ages, daughter. Started this morning. Well, you have, kids. What would you recommend? I'd recommend you eat someplace else, Johnny. <laughs> we didn't come here to eat anyway, Oldtimer. We just want a little information. You know Mrs. Uppington. Sure do, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Ain't she one of them Mabels and Sables that always looks like she was being drawn with a check rein? <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect description. You know, uh, she had a nephew working here a few days ago, and we wanted to find out something about him. Yeah. Oh, him. Kind of a musical kid, eh? Musical? Yep. Boss caught him playing pennies from heaven on the cash register. <laughs> Fired him right out on his second day of work. <laughs> Well, now tell us, what was his name? His name? Name. Yes, name. N-A-M-E, name. That thing that people always spell wrong in gold letters when they give you a billfold for Christmas. <laughs> oh, his name. Yeah. Well, let me think, kids. His name was, uh, was, uh, no, dread it, no, as well as I do my own. Ah, oh, my, this uh, is taking us up more blind alleys than a bowling ball. <laughs> Where did he go from here, Mr. Oldtimer? Uh, well, daughter, the fry cook told the dishwasher that the garbage man says the kid got a job down to the city hall. Oh, city hall, eh? Hmm, must have some influence. Yes, probably knows where the tires are buried. <laughs> well, come in again, kids, sometime when you ain't hungry. Thank you, Mr. Oldtimer. <laughs> Goodbye. All right, bud, take us to the city hall. Okay, Doc, any way you say. Mine not to reason why, mine but to do and die. Into the value with death flows the 600. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon to the behind of them. Cannon. Gee, don't you get a bang out of poetry, Doc? <laughs> Look, Swinburne, it isn't your rhyme that frightens us, it's your meter. Let's get going. Lady, use as the master. I am your slave. Consider my taxi cab your magic carpet to which gives a way to borrow... Ah, now he thinks he's Fitzpatrick. <laughs> come on, come on, get going. Doc, use as mundane. <laughs> The 
City Hall, folks. The Mu Cinephil Building. <laughs> <laughs> the seat of our local government. It's called the seat of government because if you've got any kicks to register... Oh, please, driver, please. Never mind the vaudeville. Yeah, and you better wait for us again, too, bud. We're in this far. We might as well keep on. Come on, Molly. Okay, dearie. Now, where do we go, McGee? To the mayor's office. I'm a great believer in going right to the top. I noticed that when you took me to the show the other night. Huh? <laughs> we sat so high they had oxygen tanks under the seat. <laughs> Well, hello there, folks. What goes on? Hello, Mr. Wilcox. We got to see the mayor on a little business, Harlow. Hey, do you know Mrs. Uppington's nephew? Oh, I can't say I know him exactly. I've met him. Kind of a roughneck. Why? Oh, well, what's his name? Well, his name is, uh... Uh... Well, I know his name as well as I do my own, but I can't remember it. Nah, nobody can remember that guy's name. He's as anonymous as the Iron Man in the mask. <laughs> you mean the man in the Iron Mask, Fibber? It was not. It was the Iron Man in the mask. I think Mr. Wilcox is right, dearie. Well, I know better, Molly, begging your pardon for the argument. <laughs> I remember everything I read, word for word. Do you really? Yes, I do. All right. What does the label on a can of Johnson's glow coat say? Oh, he's got you there, McGee. Oh, no, he hasn't. Now, let me think a minute. It says Johnson's Glow Coat Floor Polish. Yeah, that's right, so far. Then it says Glow Coat is a marvelous floor polish that needs no rubbing or polishing. Yeah. Easy to apply, shines as it dries to a bright, transparent luster. My that's right. My. Made for use on linoleum, rubber, asphalt base, terrazzo, whatever that is, <laughs> and varnish or painted wood floor. Well, how's he doing, Mr. Wilcox? Why, it's marvelous, word for word. Go on, Fibber. Then it says... Especially suited for kitchen linoleum and all floors which are frequently mopped because of ease with which glow coat finish can be renewed. Oh my God. Covers 3,000 square feet to the gallon. Keep from freezing. Made in the USA. Then on the other side of the container... Heavenly day. Fibber, I never heard anything like it. That's terrific. How did you ever learn to do that? Oh, it's just a trick. Anybody could do it if I told them how. <laughs> Well, if your memory is so marvelous, why can't you remember the name of Mrs. Uppington's nephew? Simply on account of I never read it any place. <laughs> well, I'll have to admit, pal, that you're slightly colossal. Wait till I write the Johnson people about this. It's amazing. I think I'll go and call them up right now. I'll see you later, folks. And from now on, it's the Iron Man in the mask. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm just happy to... He didn't learn... He didn't uh, let me try to remember what was on the other side of that container. Why, couldn't you do it? No. <laughs> he had one in his pocket, and I could only read the side. He had to it out. Why, you little fraud, McGee. How could you be so... Hey, here's the mayor's office. Come on. Hi, Latrivia. Got a minute to spare? Just about, McGee. Uh, good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. Mayor. We'll get right to the point. Do you know Mrs. Uppington? Oh, yes, indeed. Very charming woman. To you, Latrivia, any woman is charming if she's a woman and can vote. <laughs> exactly. And if she votes for me, she's not only charming, but beautiful. <laughs> That's the illogical statement I've heard since the Japs said our invasion of Africa was illegal. <laughs> Look, Mr. Mayor, for certain reasons, we want some information on Mrs. Uppington's nephew. And we heard he was working here in the city hall. If he's really working, it's a political novelty of no mean proportions, McGee. <laughs> what is the young man's name? We don't know. Well, how can I give you information about someone whose name you don't even know? I am not a swami. So what? I can't swim a stroke myself. <laughs> All we ask for... Oh, come, 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 come. I'm a busy man. I have no time to waste on ridiculous things. You answered, Mr. Mayor. It's probably for you. It's quite possible. Excuse me. Mayor's office. My honor speaking. <laughs> Big shot. Oh, yes. Well, there's only one thing to do. Get a gang of huskies and take an axe to them. What's this? You heard me. Chop off their heads so nobody will recognize them. Huh? See? Then hack off their legs and chop up the bodies and haul them away. Oh. No, 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 no. I'll meet you there at exactly midnight. Oh, what? oh stop worrying. I'll handle the police, Angle. I'll get going. 
As I'm saying, McGee... We heard every I... word of it, Mr. Trivia. You can't get away with it. You fiend in human form. You axe murderer. You, Dr. Jello and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> McGee, what do we do? Now, look here. If you insist on intruding into the affairs of this office... Oh, your affairs include murder, do they? Gangster. Molly, grab that phone and call the police. I'll handle it. Hey, now, stop it. Oh, stop it, McGee. Don't be a fool. They'll be straight. Now, let go of me. Get me the police, quick. Ow! Oh. Quite fair, Miss Trivia. Quit hitting me on the nose. <laughs> Department. This is the mayor. Give me Sergeant. that phone. Sergeant, this is the mayor. Forget this call. Now behave yourself, McGee, and go away. Okay, we'll go right to the newspapers. How do you like those potatoes? No, 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 no. Not that, McGee. They'll make an issue of it. They'll ruin me. And how about all those people you're going to murder? Yeah. Those aren't people. They're statues. Huh? We're chopping up some old iron statues in the park and turning them in for scrap metal. Now get out, both of you! <laughs> This is worth fighting for. Last night through my open window I saw the starlight gleam And then the starlight faded And through the mist of a dream I saw a peaceful old valley With a carpet of corn for a floor and I heard a voice within me whisper, This is worth fighting for. I saw a little old cabin And a river that flowed by the door And I heard a voice within me saying, This is worth fighting for. Didn't I build a cabin? Didn't I plant that corn? Didn't my folks before me fight for this country before I was born? I gathered my loved ones around me and I gazed at each face I adore and I heard a voice within me singing this is worth fighting for. Didn't I plow that valley? Didn't I reap that corn? Didn't my father's father battle for freedom when freedom was born? I gathered my loved ones around me and I gazed at each face I adore. And I heard a voice within me thunder. This is worth fighting for. All right, driver, we're all ready to go home now. Okay, lady. Gee, I was beginning to get worried about you. Why worried, bud? Well, I only got a couple of gallons of gas left, see? Though I can get 15 miles to the gallon stop and go, so I can still take you anywhere within a radio of 30 miles. You mean a radius? No, no, I never have time to listen, lady. <laughs> well, take us back to 79 Whistle Vista, bud. Oh, and... wait a minute, McGee. There's Mr. Wimple. Yo ho, Mr. Wimple. Oh, hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. Wimple. <laughs> Hi, Wimp, old man. You going our way? Yes, if you're going home, Mr. McGee. Well, hop right in, Mr. Wimple. Yeah. Oh, this is simply wonderful of you folks. Don't Sweetie Face be surprised when I tell her I had a ride in a real taxi cab. <laughs> Where have you been today, Mr. Wimple? I've been taking my ocarina lesson, Mrs. McGee. Oh, the sweet potato, eh? Yes. I've been taking lessons since 1923. Oh, <laughs> heavenly days. You must be pretty good. Have you got your ocarina with you? Oh, no, I haven't got one. You haven't? No, I haven't got that far yet. <laughs> Boy, Sweetie Face slams you around, Wimp. You better skip the sweet potato and study on the harp. Oh, she doesn't mean any harm, Mr. McGee. She's just playful. Oh. <laughs> she was playing drop the handkerchief all morning. Oh, yeah. you were really. <laughs> was it fun? Not much. 
She dropped the handkerchief out the upstairs window, and then I'd have to bring it back in the house. You mean she made you run all the way down the stairs and get the hanky and run back upstairs with it? Oh, no, Mr. McGee. She isn't that mean to me. I only had to run upstairs. The handkerchief was in my pocket when she dropped it. Well, that's different. <laughs> you know, you're quite a talented man, Mr. Wimple, the way you write poetry and play the ocarina. I used to be very good in a business way, too, Mrs. McGee. In what, Wimp? Salesmanship. Oh. They called me a red-hot salesman. What were you selling? Red hot. <laughs> Well, here we are, folks. Safe and sound. That'll be six bucks and 35 cents. Heavenly day. Well, it was in a good cause, Molly. Here's seven bucks, bud. Keep the change. All but 50 cents. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for the ride, Mr. McGee and Mrs. McGee. Goodbye now. Goodbye, Mr. Wimple. Now, so long, Wimp. Uh, ta-ta, Wally. Goodbye, Georgie. It was a nice ride. Gee, thanks, Wally. Say, do you two know each other? <laughs> My goodness, yes. We're old friends. George, this is Mr. and Mrs. McGee. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. We're old friends, too. Huh? We are? Yeah, sure. You remember me. Huh? I'm Mrs. Uppington's nephew, George Uppington. If you have Venetian blinds at your windows, you've probably noticed that they get much dirtier in winter than in summer. We receive many letters from women telling us that right about now is a good time to wax these blinds with genuine Johnson's Wax. Not only because they soil less readily, but because cleaning their waxed surfaces is so much easier. And while we're on the subject of windows, how many of you have waxed your window sills recently? When dirt and rain come in at an open window, they can't do much harm when the finish is protected with a coat of Johnson's Wax. And again, cleaning is easier, and wax surfaces add great beauty to it. The telegram just came for you. Oh, thanks. Who's it from? It's from Peoria, Illinois. It's signed Happy Whirly. Oh. We know anybody named Happy Whirly? Not that I know of. What does it say? It says, just played your new RKO picture, Here We Go Again, in my theater, and must confess, you have made everybody in Peoria ill. What? what? Let me see that wire. Huh? Oh, they've got the happy in the wrong place. It says, you have made everybody in Peoria ill. Happy. Signed, Worry. (laughs) Worry. You know, he's the theater manager there, remember? (laughs) Oh, sure. Old Len Worley. Imagine me forgetting a name. Sure. Huh? Oh, good night. (laughs) Good night, all. The characters of Wallace Wimple and the old-timer heard on this program were played by Bill Thompson. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for the home and industry. We invite you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.